Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. Welcome this Good Friday. It is wonderful that you can join me, Pastor Stephen Gord, to look at God's Word today and to celebrate what Jesus did all those years ago. It seems strange to call today Good Friday, a day where we remember his sacrifice. But that's what we're going to do today. So if you have your Bibles, you might like to just take them out. We're going to look at a few different passages. The main one we're going to look at today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21. So you might want to look that up now. We'll also have a look at a few others in a little while as well. Just to give you a heads up, on this coming Sunday, if you can join us, we would love to see you at Casino Baptist Church, 10 a.m. Resurrection Sunday, where we see it's brilliant that the story doesn't end today. That God's plan doesn't end just on Good Friday. We need Easter Sunday. We need the resurrection. We need the hope and the assurance and everything that comes with that. So please, if you can join us in person, great. If you can't, 10 o'clock, there'll be a message up on YouTube. Also remember that on Sunday morning, very early, we have to move our clocks in New South Wales back one hour. Daylight saving ends, clocks go back one hour. So that means the sermon should be up at 10 o'clock, but depending on how YouTube does their timing, it might end up being 9 o'clock. But we'll have to see. If you're ready to go at 10, it'll be ready to go at 10 as well. As we come today to open God's Word, and after the message, we will be celebrating communion together. So you might want to just go and get those elements, some bread and some grape juice or something to drink, to be ready for that. Then please do that as well. But as we come, let me open in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we just want to stop for a moment. To stop and reflect on all that you have done. Reflect on what this day means. Father, for many of us, we might be drawn to take today for granted. We celebrate it every year. But Lord, help us every single day not to forget the meaning of today. To realise that the story didn't end today as well. But Father, today was so important. A sacrifice was so important so that we could be forgiven for our sins. So, Lord, help us to remember that today, to celebrate it, and to be challenged by it. And we pray for this in your name. Amen. Well, as we come to look at God's Word today, I want to begin with a quote. And it's a quote that describes a building in New South Wales. Let's see if you can work it out. This is the quote. It stands by itself as one of the indisputable masterpieces of human creativity, not only in the 20th century, but in the history of humankind. Quick thing, what do you think the building might be? If your answer was the Opera House, you're correct. Now, who actually came up with the idea of the Opera House? Well, it was Jorn Woodson. He came up with the idea. So that's one building. Let's think of another building. Another great masterpiece of human endeavour. Let's go to America, to Keystone, South Dakota. Now, some of you might be going, oh, oh, Steve, I already know. Well, let's just give a few more details for those who don't know. There is a place where there is this mammoth sculpture of four American presidents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Ring some bells from the rest of you? What's it called? It is called Mount Rushmore. For the extra points. Who came up with the idea? Well, if you said Goodson Borglum and his son Lincoln, you would be correct. Another wonderful masterpiece. There's some of these gentlemen, these architects, these artists coming up with such great things. Here's another. Great architecture. Built in 1889, it was the opening or the archway to the World Trade Fair in that year. It has become the most visited paid monument in the world. What is it? 
this one I think many of you would have known, particularly if you've uh, been listening to some of the radio recently because they were talking about it, and that is the Eiffel Tower. Now, who came up with that idea? Who built it? Well, we don't actually know who came up with the original idea, but the company that built it was owned by Gustave Eiffel. His company designed it and built it. All of those masterpieces, and you can look around the world and see so many more, great people that came up with great ideas. Now today, it is Good Friday, and we're going to remember Jesus' death on the cross at a place called Golgotha. So here's the question. Who came up with the idea of that? Who came up with the idea of the cross, the crucifixion in the first place? And then who actually came up with the idea that Jesus had to die on a cross? Now, remember, Jesus was fully human and fully God. He was God's son. And he committed no wrongdoing. He obeyed God in everything. So he had no sin in his life whatsoever. So why did he have to die on that cross? Whose idea was it that he should die on that cross? That's what I want to think about today. Now, when you come to think of the crucifixion, you might think, well, it all started back with the Egyptians and they were pretty good at it. Or you might think, well, no, in Jesus' day or just afterwards, around 64, 66 AD, the Romans had done so many crucifixions that they ran out of wood in the Middle East. The Romans were very good at crucifying people. And when they did it, they made sure you were dead. Okay? So was it the Romans? Well, we don't really know who directly came up with the idea of crucifixion. But from the Romans back through the Egyptians and even earlier, crucifixion was often done. But who came up with the idea of Jesus dying on the cross? I mean, we've just finished this uh, series in our church at the moment. We've just been looking at the Old Testament book of Judges. And we've seen in it that when God's people have a leader and they're doing the right thing, they worship him. But after a while, they look at the other nations, they get complacent. They drift away. They turn their back on God. The judge or their leader is off, often dies. No one is leading them. They do their own thing and they just turn their back on God. They think they can solve their own problems, but they can't. And they finally hit rock bottom. And at this point, they often cry out. When we read the book of Judges, we realize often they just cried out because they were in pain or they were suffering or they were in slavery or they were about uh, to starve or be defeated by an army. They rarely ever asked for forgiveness. They really rarely ever did repent, but they cried out to God anyway. They hit rock bottom and then they cry out to God. And we saw this cycle that God would then, out of his grace and out of his mercy, he would save them. They would live for a while again in the promised land and then the cycle would go round again. That happened over and over and we see it throughout the Old Testament. Over and over, God saves his people over and over, they turn their back on him. Over and over, they cry out, God save us! And he does! But finally, they end up getting kicked out of the promised land. And they spend centuries looking for the answer, looking for God to save them. We get towards the end of the Old Testament. and the book of Zechariah, God gives this message through this prophet. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. God's people keep crying out. Now this uh, prophecy was about 700, maybe 800 years uh, before Jesus. And last Sunday, the Sunday just gone, on our religious calendar, and you may have celebrated in your church, we call it Palm Sunday. We remember the time that Jesus enters Jerusalem. And do you know what? When he enters Jerusalem for that final time, this is the prophecy he fulfills. He comes in riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal 
of a donkey. God's people, they saw the prophecies in the Old Testament. They realized that God would send them a king, that God would send them someone they called the Messiah, and he was the anointed one, and he would lead the Jewish people, they thought, to a military victory, that the, this military king would save them. Now, when you get this prophecy from Zechariah, you realize, yes, Jesus fulfills it. But it's not really the military Messiah king picture that the people had. And when we think of Jesus entering Jerusalem on that Sunday, just a few days ago, what did he do? Did he enter Jerusalem, turn left, head towards the Roman barracks and start a revolution? No. He wasn't that warrior king that they expected. What did he do? He turned right after he entered Jerusalem. He went to the temple and he put the Jewish religious leaders in their place. That's not quite what the Jews were looking for. It wasn't their picture of the Messiah. But that's what he came to do. He came to take, tell God's people they had to get right with God. Now this the Jewish leaders, they didn't like that. The religious leaders got so angry that they put their final plan into process so that Jesus would be arrested and that he'd be crucified. He'd be put to death. So they start their plan. Thursday night, what we often remember as the Last Supper, Jesus sits down with his disciples, celebrates that meal. Then afterwards, uh, as they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's in the middle of the night. They are arrested and Jesus is dragged away. He's dragged before Annas, the high priest. He's then taken to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and all of them. They look at Jesus and say, guilty. God's son has committed no sin, committed no wrong. All the way through, even Roman government law hadn't broken anything. But they say he's guilty. They then take him on Friday morning before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is the Roman governor. And they take, it to, take Jesus to him and say, rubber stamp the approval. We want to crucify Jesus. We want to put him to death. Rubber stamp it for us. Now Pontius Pilate realised that they were doing a deal on him and it was not right. So he says, I find that this guy has done nothing wrong. But they kept badgering him. And finally, he says, OK, OK, I wash my hands. This has nothing to do with me now. His blood's on your head. Gives the rubber stamp. Jesus is sent to his crucifixion. And later, just a few hours later, Jesus dies. That's the lead up and the story of Good Friday in a nutshell. So back to my original question, who came up with the idea that Jesus had to die on the cross? Was it the Romans? As I said earlier, they were pretty good at crucifying people. Pontius Pilate? Well, probably not. Yes, he did rub a stamp and he did it for political reasons, but he didn't actually find anything wrong with Jesus. Was it the Jewish mob? Was it the Jewish religious leaders? Judas Iscariot? What about Satan himself? Whose idea was it for Jesus to die on that cross? Or maybe you've actually heard people say that the idea, you know, the reason why Jesus was up there, it's us. It's us. Yeah, we were the ones that actually put Jesus on the cross. So who came up with the idea? Who came up with the idea for Jesus to die on the cross? Now you might rightly say, I think all of them, or a bit of all of them, and you're probably right. But who was it really? Who was behind it all? I'm going to read to you now a few verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now this is from verse 18 through to 21. Please read with me if you've got it. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he was committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, 
as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul gives us the answer here. Who does Paul say is the answer or the reason why Jesus had to die on the cross? God. All this, verse 18, is from God. From first to last, from the beginning of creation to Jesus' death on the cross and everything since, it's all part of God's plan. Now we know uh, the verses John 3.16. Let me read to you John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Who does it all? Whose idea was it for Jesus to die on the cross? Whose idea was it for Jesus to die at this time? Whose plan was it? Whose will was it? God's. It's always been God. God heard the cry of his people throughout history. He looked at humanity. He saw their helplessness. He saw their hopelessness. He saw our helplessness, our hopelessness, because we, from the moment we are born, we are under the burden of sin. We're sinners. We cannot fix the problem ourselves. So God sends his own son. His own son who had you know, fulfilled the prophecies from the Old Testament. God had said, this is what I was going to do. And the Jewish people and lots of people all missed it. God fulfills his promises. As he always does, 100% of the time. Fulfills his promises. And part of that was that a sacrifice had to be made and his son had to die. It was God's plan all along. It was God's plan for the Messiah, for the King, the Anointed One to come. And it was Jesus. But why? I mean, you probably just heard the words ringing in your ears from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God doesn't want people to die separated from him. And God is saying in the Bible that there is only, there are only two ways to live. You either live God's way or you don't. That when you die or when Jesus returns, then we will stand before God. If we follow Jesus, God will see us as part of his family and welcome us into heaven. But if we're not, if we think, oh, I can make that choice later in life and we haven't made it, or if we think I'm just going to ignore God, or if we make an active choice to say, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with God, then God will say, no, I don't know you. You're not part of my family. And we'll end up in hell, separated from God for eternity. God gives a choice. And in a way, it's a very simple choice. But it is so complex for us as humans to make. Do we love and follow Jesus, be a part of God's family, or not? That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, it said, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This Good Friday, if you have not made the choice to follow Jesus yet, I follow those words. I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God today. What choice will you make? Now we can see hear those words, be reconciled to God, and we can think, hey, I can fix the problem myself. But we can't. All through history, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, they decided they could fix the problem themselves. And over and over again, they realized they couldn't. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the intelligence. They didn't have the power. Whatever it might be, they could not 
fix the problem themselves. So God did it. God sent his son. God's plan always. Jesus was the one to die on the cross so we could be forgiven. So we could be reconciled to him. Following Jesus is all we have to do. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter how good we think we've been or how bad we have been. God doesn't hold that against us. The moment we love and follow Jesus, give our life to him and want to live his way, then we are welcomed into God's family. And we can have the assurance, we can know for certainty, and we'll remind ourselves of this on Easter Sunday, that we have the certainty that we will be with God forever. Have you made that choice today? Now, many of you watching this would say, yeah, yeah, Stephen, I made that choice. Great. Well, back to verse 20. It said, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Now, ambassadors, when they speak, it's as though they are speaking the words of the country they represent. So what it says here, are we Christ's ambassadors? Are we living a life? Are we speaking the words that are the words of Christ? That are pointing people to Christ? particularly at Easter time? Are we taking the time to share Jesus with people, reminding them that we have this choice? There's only one real choice in life. Are you with Jesus, with God, or not? The Bible's pretty clear. Only two ways to live. What choice will you make? I prayed earlier about Today is a day that we often take for granted. And I think we do. It's the same when we celebrate communion. I think at times we take that for granted. We're just going to do that in a few moments' time. But it should remind us, particularly today, and that's why I like to celebrate communion on today, Good Friday. It reminds us that it was part of God's plan that Jesus had to die. And when he died, it is the one and only way that we could become friends with God again. So what does Easter in 2021 mean to you? Chocolate, family, friends, holidays, COVID restrictions? What does it mean for you? What does it, you re, do you remember that God loved you so much that his own son died for you? We can never take Good Friday for granted. We should never take the time when we celebrate the Lord's Supper or Communion for granted. So who came up today? Who was the architect for the cross? Who came up with the idea? Probably the greatest idea ever to save mankind. Who thought of it? God. It was always God. Always his will. Always his plan. Now, when you think about some of those architects I talked about back at the beginning, those people who came up with the great idea and built those great monuments and structures, most of them are dead and buried. Their masterpieces one day will return to dust and be no more. But God, God is the eternal architect. He wants people to live a life forever. He wants, as John 3, 16, 17 reminded us. He doesn't want to condemn us. He wants us to be a part of his family. But the only way, the plan all along, was that Jesus, his sinless son, the Messiah, the anointed one, Christ, had to die on that cross. Let me pray. Father, help us just this morning to reflect on what Good Friday is. Father, also help us to think about where we stand with you. Have we, If this is the biggest and greatest and really only choice to make in life, are we with you or against you? Lord, what choice have we made today? Father, we thank you that you're the great architect. We thank you that your will and purpose, nothing gets in the way of. And that you always planned 
that Jesus would die so we would be forgiven. Today we remember that, we celebrate it, and above all, and even though it sounds so in a way little or pitiful, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Father, help us, for those who have loved and followed you already, may we respond today by making sure we are your ambassadors and telling people about the saving knowledge of Jesus. And Lord, if there is someone who may be watching today who has not responded, or a family member who has not responded, Lord, we just pray for each and every one of them. And Lord, if they've got questions, may they ask a Christian that they might know. Lord, we just ask today that you will guide us to be the people you want us to be in your name. As I said, when we come to Good Friday, when we remember the death, when we remember the sacrifice, to me it is so fitting that we celebrate communion together. And so I'd love us to do that right now. And uh, if you've got some bread or you've got uh, some grape juice there, you might like to grab that as well. I'm going to share today just a few words uh, from 1 Corinthians that Paul wrote to that church and he talked to them about the Lord's Supper. Because on the night, just a few hours before Jesus died, he celebrated that last supper with his disciples. He reinterpreted and said, you've been celebrating this for many years. But do you know what? It's always been about me. And in a few hours, you're going to see why. God was the architect. God's plan always was going to be the cross. Let's be thankful for that as we remember the symbols today. The symbols of the broken bread and the grape juice, the body broken, the bloodshed. Let me read to you a few verses. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he took some bread, probably not flatbread like this. He broke it and he said, remember, when my body is broken, they didn't really understand that it was going to be in a few hours time. It had to happen. Sacrifice had to be paid. Blood had to be shed. His body had to be broken so that he would fulfill the promises in the Old Testament. And then a few hours he did. God was the architect, and God's plan always works. If you love Jesus this morning, let us eat together and remember what he did for us. Continuing from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're still waiting for that day. We're still waiting for him to return. Another promise that God made that God will keep. So we have assurance of that. We have hope in that, and we look forward to it. So again, if you've got your grape juice, you might like to take that out or whatever you might have there to drink. We're going to drink together, realising that God is our head of the family, head of the church, and that we love and follow him. We are his children because of what Jesus did at that cross. Will you drink with me? Let's drink together. Gracious Lord, we do look forward to the day when your son returns. 
while we wait, help us to be your people. Grant us feet to walk across the room to talk to others and a voice to share the saving knowledge of Jesus. We ask this today in your name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining with me on this Good Friday. As I said, Easter Sunday, story doesn't end here. And we should be very, very thankful for that. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, 10 o'clock. If you could join us uh, physically at church, Casino Baptist Church. If not, we would love for you to catch up online. So the sermon will go up at 10 o'clock. Again, remember, daylight saving changes Sunday morning in New South Wales. Clocks go back one May God bless you. May he watch over you and your family this Easter time. Let's go out and celebrate. Be thankful for all that he has done. God bless and I'll see you later.